morning, friends. My name is Chris Holmes. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. And whether you are worshiping with us in this space or joining us online or catching up at some point later in the week, welcome. We are glad you are here with us this morning. Just a few announcements for you as we get started in worship this morning. First, we would be remiss if we didn't say welcome back to Jens, and we are so grateful that he is back with us. <laughs> Jens and I talked a little bit earlier this morning. It sounds like he had a, a very restful and meaningful time at sabbatical, but we're all grateful that he's back. Grateful as well for the great service of Victoria Shorkova, who filled in during Yen's absence. We would love for you to let us know that you are here by checking in with us using our text to check in system. If you want specific instructions, turn to the back of your bulletin on the welcome page. There's a QR code and instructions. Or you can simply text check in to the number 1-844-900-2372. Again, 1-844-900-2372. Just one small way that we can stay in contact with you and you with us. One more celebration that we want to highlight we celebrate the birth of David Muang, born on July the 10th, to John and Mary Beth Muang. Proud grandparents and aunt are FPC members David and Anne Drake and Catherine Drake. We are grateful for these gifts of new life. There are other announcements in the back of your bulletin that I invite you to peruse at your convenience. But for now, let us worship the living God. Call to worship can be found on page seven of the bulletin. God created the earth and all that dwells in it and made humanity in the image of God. Let us worship the living God. God led the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt to God's promised land. Let us worship the living God. God raised up judges, prophets, priests, and kings to guide and correct God's people. Let us worship the living God. In Jesus, God took on flesh, fully entered the human condition, and modeled the way of love and service. Let us worship the living God. God raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to God's right hand where he reigns with God and intercedes on our behalf. Let us worship the living God. God sends the Holy Spirit to comfort and surprise, to illumine our minds and lead us in the way of Jesus. Friends, let us worship the living God. By
I invite you to a time of confession. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us, and we deceive even ourselves. And yet, if we confess our sin, God, who is merciful and who is just, will forgive us our sin and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it is with humility and with faith that we approach the throne of grace. We pray with the words found printed in the order of service together, and then we have a moment for the silent prayers of our hearts. Let us pray. Loving and living God, we confess that it is easy to forget all of your powerful and gracious deeds in the past. We too easily become obsessed with our own projects and plans that we overlook what you are doing. We become anxious about managing things beyond our control and despair when life does not go according to our plans. We offer only parts of ourselves to you and your ways, keeping what we hold too dear or fear too much to release. We would limit your power and creativity and confine you to our doctrine or places of worship. O oh God, forgive and heal us, that we might live more freely and faithfully to your glory. Amen. Friends, the psalmist reminds us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so too is God's steadfast love for those who fear God. And that as far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen.
Amen. Our first reading for today is from the book of Ephesians. It's found on page 181 in the New Testament portion of the Pew Bible. Hear now the good news for us today. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jamie. It is always a delight and a joy to have our little children with us in worship. But for some children between the ages of four and third grade, this is an opportunity uh, to go to godly play, if you wish. Sarah Kate, I think, is by the exit here uh, to welcome our godly players, and we are glad that they will Learn about God and play there. Immediately after worship, parents, please pick up your children from the Worth Room. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 14a. It can be found in the Old Testament portion of the Pew Bible on page 268. Listen now. For a word from God. Now, when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of the Lord stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in tent and tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over all the people of Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, 
and have cut off all of your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your, your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. This, too, is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Loving and living God, breathe your Holy Spirit upon these ancient words and upon our hearts and minds, that they might become for us a living word, not just a word, to a community, to a nation, to a culture different from our own, but even a word for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was in graduate school, I was a part of a cohort funded by the Lilly, Endo the, the Lilly Endowment that was operated out of Valparaiso University. The Lilly Fellowship, as it was known, convened small groups of graduate students from all around the country of all different academic backgrounds early in their graduate work. The program lasted three years and included monthly meetings online way before Zoom was a thing and three in-person retreats over the summers. Focusing on the intersections of the humanities and fine arts, the fellowship was something of a great books course for graduate students. We read Dostoevsky and Augustine, we explored Christine's Christine Pohl's book on hospitality and Chaim Potok's no novel, The Chosen. We paired the Southern Gothic in Flannery O'Connor's short stories with images of the afterlife in Dante's Purgatorio. It was a fantastic experience. Through this fellowship, I was exposed to the artwork of Andy Goldsworthy. If you haven't heard of him, you should definitely Google him. Maybe not right this second, but when you get home after lunch, give him a Google. Working with natural materials in the environment, Goldsworthy builds art that disappears after the passage of a certain amount of time. Videos and photographs capture his creations and their inevitable demise. For example, he once spent hours collecting different colored leaves in the forest, only to capture and choreograph a 30-second parade of these different colored leaves moving down a flowing stream. Or once he got up in the middle of the night to work in freezing temperatures to build an amazing sculpture made out of icicles only to see his project slowly melt away in the midday sun. His art is stunning and beautiful, but it is also intentionally fleeting and temporary. As I've been thinking about this passage from 2 Samuel 7, the question of building and making has come back again and again. The verbs for building or making appear frequently in our passage, and God's point of contention with David seems to be all about building and making. And building is also very much a part of our local 
and national conversation as well. Our elected officials are considering a major infrastructure plan while billionaires build toward commercial outer space travel. Georgia is planning to build a high-speed railway to Charlotte. And if you drive around Atlanta, it seems like we live in one big construction site with one new high-density construction site after the other. Building is in our DNA. I think our passage invites us this morning to consider not only what we are building, but how we are building, the disposition with which we build. As you know, we've been working our way through the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel this summer. Just as a quick recap, 1st Samuel captures the struggle between Saul, Israel's first king, and David, a young upstart who eventually becomes king in the place of Saul. 2nd Samuel focuses almost all of its intention on David. After Saul's death, David is made king of Judah and eventually becomes the king of Israel, thus uniting for a very short time the northern and southern kingdoms. Much of the narrative details David's military exploits as he, bow as he battles both foreign and domestic enemies. In short, David's rise to power and his reign were not simple or even expected. Rather, they were tumultuous and disruptive at almost every turn. This background highlights the importance of the first verse in our passage. Now, when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. You can almost hear the verse express a sigh of relief. <sighs> David is settled, and he is experiencing rest, God-given rest. But almost immediately, it seems, David becomes restless, he looks around at his fantastic palace built with the finest materials of the region and he remembers the Ark of God and he is concerned and he expresses his misgivings to the prophet, to the prophet Nathan. At first, David's confession to Nathan seems to come from the best of intentions. If the king lives in luxury, shouldn't his God also have a fancy house? And Nathan agrees at first. Great, he says, go do whatever you want. God is with you, blessing you in whatever you decide to do. It appears that David has divine approval for this temple building project. But then comes the curveball. God gives Nathan a vision at night, delivering a message that both clarifies God's purposes and censures David's intentions. God pulls no punches in responding to David's best intentions. Are, are you going to build me a house? And by the way, did I ever say that I needed or wanted a house of cedar? The assumed answer to both questions is no. David won't be the builder of the house, nor has God expressed the desire to move into some fancy permanent residence. Then God seems to ask David a third question. Do you remember all that I have done for you and what I've promised to do for you in the future? Apparently not. Build a house for me, God asks? No way. Instead, God says, I will make you into a house. I'll make you into a dynasty, and the throne of your offspring will be established forever. It may just be me, but I experienced something of textual whiplash reading this passage. 
It opens with David's experience of rest, a tangible and deeply significant sign of God's blessing. It moves into what seems like a good, even pious idea that initially receives divine approval. Then boom, God's nighttime oracle moves the passage in a totally different direction. God doesn't want or need a temple. How dare you think otherwise, David? And right as we settle into this, the temple is not necessary sort of thinking, bam, the text moves in another direction. God will accept a temple, but it's Solomon, David's son, who will build it. Build the temple. God is with you. No, 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 don't build it. Who needs a temple anyways? Okay, a temple's fine, but it's just not yours to build, David. To make sense of this jolting passage and and its on and off again nature, many biblical scholars propose the interweaving of different traditions here. The different theological or religious viewpoints are a result of combining different sources that were written at different times. Regardless of how we make sense of this passage, one thing should be clear. The twists and turns in 2 Samuel press against a simple or surface level understanding of the passage. Its complex, cacophonous nature requires that we linger and wrestle with its message a bit. And all the more so if we hope to hear in it a word of God for us today. I want us to look more closely at David's pious intentions and God's response to see how they might speak to our own desires to build for ourselves and our communities and even for our world. At first, David's intentions to build seem pure. His impulse makes sense. Why should a king live in luxury and his, his, his God live out in a tent somewhere? Doesn't God deserve better? And why shouldn't David be the one to give it to God? But do you hear that? That subtle pr- presumption? David will be the one to give God what he thinks God needs. David will fill up what God lacks. David will remove the perceived sense of God's inadequacy. To understand just how problematic David's proposed action is, we need to take a quick detour to the ancient system of patronage, a system that was ubiquitous in the ancient world. Patronage refers to the scripted relationships between a patron and his or her clients. Patrons had a store of power and resources, and clients relied on the goodwill, the benevolence of the patrons for their well-being and survival and, yes, their building projects. By presuming to build God a house, David makes himself into the patron and turns God into the beneficiary of his generosity. David presents himself as the one with power and resources. In his distorted view, God requires his good will. And David may have even thought that the construction of the temple for God would secure his family's right to the throne. After all, if David was the one who built this fabulous home for God, Shouldn't his children be king forever? God's response to David corrects his distorted view in two ways. First, God reminds David of God's gracious and powerful acts in the past. God took David, a no-name shepherd boy, and made him into the ruler of Israel. God's presence went with David wherever he went and defeated his enemies along the way. And God lists a number of things that will happen in the future. 
God will make David's name great. God will plant the people of Israel in their own place. God will give David rest and establish his line. The point is clear. David is not the one with power and resources. God is. David has become who he is because of God's goodness and grace. Likewise, Israel's success in the past and in the future depends entirely on God's good will. Second, God expresses a preference for dwelling in a tent instead of in a temple. Now, I don't think that this means that spaces of worship like this fabulous space are unnecessary or problematic. Nor do I think that religious rituals or fixed places of worship are bad. Instead, I think God's response to David communicates a far greater theological point. God will not be constrained by human limits. God resists being tied down to one place because God prefers to move about freely. The text reminds David and us of God's freedom and otherness. God is living and surprising and mysterious. God is not beholden to our buildings or our dogmas or even our best laid plans. David's pious pre presumptions and God's response have at least two things to say to us today. First, they remind us, as Ephesians 2.10 puts it, that we are what God has made us. We are God's workmanship. We are God's building. In God, we live and move and have our being. God does not depend on us. We depend on God. Second, I think that David's intended actions invite us to some honest self and communal reflection. How do we attempt to fill up what is lacking in God? How do we try to make up for God's perceived inadequacy? How do we attempt to control God or make God's ways predictable? Maybe we offer quick fix solutions instead of making space and time for the long, worth, the long work of grief or discipleship or reconciliation. Or maybe we become overbearing and controlling in times of uncertainty. Maybe we come to see ourselves as owners of some project or organization or even ministry instead of servants entrusted by God for the work. Or maybe we simply think that we can build or plan or manage or calculate or forecast our ways in such a way that relying on God's goodness and mercy becomes an afterthought. What are your pious presumptions? And how might God be inviting you and inviting me to release them and cling more fully to God's goodness and grace? Let me conclude by returning to the artwork of Andy Goldsworthy. There is no doubt that his art requires effort and creativity and significant planning. It is intentional and strategic work. But Goldsworthy builds fully aware of the limits of his projects and their fleeting nature. And if you've ever watched him create his art, it seems as though this gives him all the more joy in building. Like Goldsworthy, we can plan and work creatively we can strategize and host visioning sessions. We can work hard, and we should. 
but I hope that we can also learn to build for the joy of building and let go of our need for control or our desire to build for perpetuity. In the end, our efforts are limited and the outcomes are unpredictable. But God is good and gracious and free. May we learn to build in response to God's wild goodness and freedom instead of our own pious presumptions. Amen. We turn again to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of peace, we come before you giving thanks for the gift of this day and for the light and the promise that you offer to our world. We pray for peace for this planet so filled with pain, where people look at one another with bitterness and hate in their hearts. Teach us ways to reconcile our differences to break down the dividing walls. Where families are separated by anger and frustration, give us that love that overcomes disillusion and rebellion. Where nations fight internally or with one another, teach us to live in peace and harmony, to make our swords into plowshares. And where we individuals where we are overcome with pain. Give us your peace that surpasses all human understanding. And where there are signs and seeds of peace, tiny though they may be, help us to celebrate their presence, nurture them with vigilance, and rejoice in the growth. God of all goodness, you teach us to love one another, and you plant in our souls the desire to connect, support, and engage, nurture in us this notion that we are all members of one body, dependent on each other, and that we find our identity in you. And with our reliance, our connectedness, our community, keep us focused on your kingdom praying for your will in this world, working steadily in your ways. We pray today for our brothers and sisters, for your beloved children. We pray for those who are discouraged and feel left behind by life. We pray for those who have no hope and nothing to hope for. We pray for those who live in fear or suffer violence and they do not know where to turn for peace. We pray for those who live in the midst of plenty yet find no meaning in life. We pray for those facing death and for those who mourn. Make us, O oh God, instruments of your peace, agents of your justice, reconciliation, and bearers of hope. Holy One, make us one as you are one, and strengthen us to do your will and to remember always your claim on our lives. We pray together the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, let us go from here into the wild world that God is creating. Let us build with creativity and vision and effort, but let us do so in light of and in response to God's goodness, grace, and freedom. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and be upon each of you now and always. Amen.